Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Tony Bushell from Zero Sum Studio. I'm the designer and writer of the Distemper comic book and tabletop role-playing game. Uh, you can find me at www.distemperverse.com or on Twitter at Zero Sum Games, zero with an X. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual. Not only does he have a amazing TTRPG game, but he also has a comic that coincides with it. Either way, they're both one and the same because it's a, an interesting franchise. But we're joined by the ever-talented Tony Bichel, creator of Stemper, and of course, from Zero Sum Studio. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much, uh, Kurt. It's very, very nice to see you in person. It's kind of weird. Like, I have been watching you for a while. It's kind of fun interacting with you in person. So thanks for having me on. Oh, not a problem. I've been looking at your stuff social media wise, and we've connected, uh, obviously, on there, but also through mutual friends as well, too. And it's great to see what you're doing, because I, I love what you're creating. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, though, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Yeah, so thank you again. So my name's Tony. So I've been reading comics since I was a kid, right? It's that cliche of kind of, I learned to read by kind of looking at the pictures and then picking up the words. So I've always been a huge comic book fan and I've been role playing since I was in high school and I look very young and pretty, right? But I'm actually in my early fifties. So I've been role playing since the pink and blue Dungeons and Dragons books in the early eighties. Those have been like really my only two hobbies ever, right? And there was a big dry spell when I couldn't find anyone to play role playing games with. So I'd continue to just buy them and like a complete nerd, I'd read just the rule books right and kind of go through the mechanics it was something that was always kind of near and dear to my heart a couple of years ago i started playing role-playing games pretty seriously well not seriously but like regularly with some friends of mine just before the pandemic like six months before in like early 2019 i decided there's a fit i have a really boring job right so i'm in it i'm part of a managed services group i really enjoy it as a nerd but it's not really a very creative outlet right it's very kind of technical and it's very kind of objective so i started doing a lot of homebrew stuff while i was playing role-playing games with people and then I decided to work on a game that I wanted to play for myself, right? A very kind of brutally realistic post-apocalyptic game where the post-apocalyptic setting was very grounded, where combat would be completely brutal. I grew up playing the original Little Black Books of Traveler and then Twilight 2000. So I like kind of crunchy games and I like games with a strong element of realism. So I started building out this role-playing game and then the pandemic hit and I stopped writing it for a while, right? <laughs> writing a game about a world-killing pandemic wasn't all that fun in the pandemic, right? So so the premise for the setting, because the setting really comprises both the role-playing game and the comic book, right? And they come together in what I lovingly call the distemperverse, right? Because it's kind of a combination of the, or the stories told locally at a table on a VTT at the games, and then the other stories told kind of globally in the comic book. It's kind of a, you know, those two come together in what I call the distemperverse. The setting itself, it's post-apocalyptic. Canine distemper, which is very benign to us, has mutated and become absolutely deadly to the human race. So inside of a year, 90% of humanity have died out. What's left is kind of ugly, right? There's no zombies, there's no undead, there's no mutants or aliens. There's just hunger, right? And there's the cold and there's other survivors that are trying to put their survival above yours. So in essence, what I've created is a very realistic game. I'll stop now, I swear to God. It's more than just a dungeon crawl, right? There's community rules, building tribes, for building cults. There's like, I mean, the idea is more than just survival, but at its core, it's very much a survival horror game. As I started playtesting that, the stories I was telling with my playtesting group were just fascinating, right? And having always been a huge comic book fan, I started taking some of the stories that were being told in the games that we were playing. And I've been very lucky with the playtest group. I found a bunch of people that really like the game and the setting. And a couple of them have actually run games for me, right? One ran a long campaign that was much more like Monty than the game I was running, but in the same setting. And it was freaking awesome where we ended up on Alcatraz with The Rock. It's been great fun playing and seeing other people adopt this world, right? And so the comic book, it ties in 
into the game. The first arc that's being published later this year by Blood Moon Comics is also an adventure module that's being released, right? There's differences between the comic book and the game that you could play, but in theory, a GM can read the comic and then run the exact scenario for people, right? And if they've read the comic book, cool, there's rules in there for how you'd change it. But the idea is to present a more engaging world, right? A world that's more layered, perhaps. There's a backdrop that's constantly evolving in the comic books where there's, you know, macro and micro, there's all these different elements to it. Players can take any of that and play that at their table, virtual or, or real. And there's also an online component, but I'll talk about that later. Did that help, Kurt? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, I, I got a, a general gist of the world itself here. But also your website helps a lot as well, too. You have a lot of documentation from the images that I, I got to see from, from the comic itself. It looks incredible. Thank you. What's the most misunderstood aspect of a dystopian comic versus a dystopian TTRPG that you create? One is more fluid than the other, right? So really when it comes to the game, I'm creating, you know, it's funny, I've been working on the SRD for the game, right? And so I'm really just creating a series of mechanics that could be used to tell other stories, right? The comic book itself is much more in depth, right? And I'm really kind of fleshing that out. And I'm, I'm kind of taking what would be, you know, rules for how to do something and I'm turning that into a story mechanic, right? And, and it goes from game mechanic to a story mechanic, I guess that's an easy way to say it. In terms of the difference, there isn't much, right? They're both in the same setting. So working on one bizarrely perhaps helps me further the other, right? When I'm working on the comic book, it helps me flesh out the world what's gone before. The artist I'm working with, who's fantastic, a guy called, I can't pronounce his last name, he's Serbian, he's Nenad Civilian, fairly well-known artist, right? And he's been working on an ongoing Serbian fantasy comic. He's really great. You know, some of the work he did, you know, the script talks about, hey, paint the world during the pandemic and paint what's going on. Some of the artwork that he produced really inspired me, right? And it was kind of like, hey, let me go back and revisit the history of the world to make the history of the world more like the pictures that he's drawn. This has been something, as I mentioned, I've been working on, this is year four of working on this, right? So I've had five or six short stories. I wanted to be very respectful working with artists, right? Because I know that there's a lot of people that work, ask them to work for free. So if I wanted to work with an artist, if I like what I saw on their online portfolios, I wrote a short story and had them illustrate them, paid them for it, obviously, and had them illustrate the short story. So if you go to globalcomics.com and look for Distemper, there's, I think, five short stories up there of different people that I've worked with, and they've just been fantastic. I've been super lucky, I think. I've worked with five different artists on five different stories, and every experience has been fantastic, and every art style has been completely different, but it's allowed me to use those art styles in both the TTRPG and on the website. So I've been very lucky that other people are helping me flesh out this world in that respect. In terms of the differences, not really much. One really does help me with the other simply by virtue of forcing me to examine and think about the world a little bit deeper. What is it about the dystopian genre or theme that people misunderstand? I think that often in dystopian fantasy or dystopian fiction, there's almost a sense of hope, right? And I'm not sure that I believe fully in in that hope. From my accent, I'm obviously not a Native American, right? I've been here for 22 years this year. During Hurricane Katrina, just seeing what happened when the lights went out for eight hours, right? And when there was really kind of like, it really showed me that humanity could sink pretty quickly. In a lot of dystopian fiction or in a lot of dystopian games, I think that there's an element of like, hey, humanity will rise through, right? Humanity will get better and will come together. And I don't know if I believe in, I think that in small pockets and groups, absolutely people will do that. They'll fight to keep their family safe and they'll do all that kind of good stuff they've done before. But I think if there is some kind of extinction level event, in my particular world, there's a, a billion people left, which is a huge number of people, right? But it takes us back to the population level of like 1825, where there were still people everywhere, but just not in the numbers there are today, right? And so I think when you've got that many people and there's no more resources and nothing's being produced and there aren't enough skill sets, even with a billion people to keep things running, let alone the organizational structure, let alone any kind of government or taxes or facilities that going on. So for me personally, like I thought The Road had a very good take on dystopia, the traveler and his boy, right? That was really it. Everyone else was a threat and everyone else was a risk. And there was no kind of like hope in the world. And that was painted out in the book by the kind of the environment, right? Like everything was dark and the world was burning. All too often I see dystopian, I don't want to sound negative because uh, I am a believer in humanity, but all too often I see dystopia where there's a, we'll come together and rise up and make things better. I don't know if I believe in that. I think it will take individuals coming together, create a new society to force people to act better in, in my own humble opinion. What challenges do you think comic creators face in today's society that they're trying to push through to produce their own creations? 
That's a really great question, by the way. As an outsider, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Almost anecdotally, back in my mid-20s, I, I moved around a lot, right? I lived in Israel, I lived in Paris and Brussels, and then Amsterdam for a while. And when I was in Amsterdam, I wrote and drew my own comic. There was really no mechanism for getting it published beyond going to a publisher. Living in Amsterdam, where it was, you know, American comic culture or more kind of Western comic, it was like very European and like very tinted and asterisk, and there was a lot of great, really great European stuff that was produced. It wasn't really what I was producing at the time, right? And so so making my own and trying to get that out there felt impossible back in the, that would have been in the 90s, right? So back in the kind of the mid to late 90s, just the idea that I was going to produce something and somehow photocopy it enough and get it into comic book stores, it just seemed ridiculous, right? And so I think fast forward by like 30 years or whatever, right? I think the things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo and all these different platforms and global comics that I mentioned earlier, where you can monetize and where you can charge people to read. I think that the platform variety is much greater now, but I think that leads to a diffusion of the audience right and so i have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old a nine-year-old daughter a seven-year-old son and every week my daughter's not interested in comics at all i've been taking her since she was like 15 months old and she's just not interested in comic books at all but my son loves them so every week we go to the comic book store i'm blessed with a, a great comic book store, hall of justice in denver if anyone's ever out here actually in parker if anyone's ever out in this direction go to hall of justice the most amazing comic book store run by the most amazing people and it's great because i get to see all these they order a ton of indie comics and i get to see all this i don't really read superheroes anymore it's much more kind of like independent stuff that I'm interested in. They have a great selection. The diffusion of the audience that goes on because I go there, but then I'm on Twitter a lot looking for new platforms i back a lot of stuff on kickstarter right and like indiegogo and so on because i want to support new talent and frankly there's stories that people seem to be telling on those platforms that i'm not going to find in a comic book store right or i'd be lucky to find in a comic book store right and things that are like whimsical and things that aren't even very good but are a great expression of art my point in saying this is i think that that's a real challenge right where do you go i saw an indie creator that i really admire like jeff schiller the guy behind magic yeah. powder who frankly his comic book is great right i really enjoy the story the artwork as well by daniela it's just out of this world is just awesome right but i think he's done a great job of creating this compelling world right and he's having great success on kickstarter which i love to see i backed almost everything he's done right because i just enjoy the product and i think he's doing it the right way he sent a tweet out a couple of weeks ago that said something to the effect of i would never want to go to a comic publisher because it would limit my reach which i totally understand i totally respect but then i wonder how many people are going to pick something up in a comic book store that they wouldn't go to a platform like kickstarter for actually let me say one last thing and this this might illustrate it when i was growing up there were three tv channels so everyone was watching the same stuff you know there were a limited number of comic books enough to go on like one rotary kind of display at my local news agent or convenience store such a, a limited amount of content that everyone shared in the same stuff good bad or indifferent right i think that there's so much option there's content overload now right where people are recommending the show to my wife and i and i'm like i'm just never going to get to watch it right i'm not being difficult with the person i'm sure it's fantastic but there are shows that i still haven't i've never seen game of thrones right now i'm going to get my geek credentials taken away from me but i've never seen it because we just didn't have time i feel that's the issue right there's such a diffusion of the audience now where there's so many platforms and places for me to go and consume content that i can't consume it all and i don't even know that i'm missing stuff until someone says hey there was a show or a documentary or a song or whatever that you would have really liked and i'm kind of like maybe if i'm lucky i'll get to it but probably not so i know i'm bypassing content i would really like so i think that's the biggest challenge that faces some people like do you want to be independent and own your output and get to like 300 people or do you want to potentially get into a comic book store and that potentially get out to a thousand people pick your poison right but i think that's a real challenge i really frankly was very lucky with blood moon they reached out to one of the artists i was working with i was gonna go kickstarter for the whole thing right and i was really racking my brains and like watching a ton of other people like what do they do and how are they successful so there's almost a sense of relief for me because blood moon have been great to work with so far and they're going to get into comic book stores i'm going to get the pleasure of seeing it in my own comic book store locally i'm going to be on the shelf though which is just mind-boggling but anyone that sees that is potentially going to be driven to the game and vice versa i don't know if that helps i just think there's so many options and outlets at the moment that the diffusion of the audience is an issue for me like and here goes my geek cred right? like i haven't seen the rest of loki i haven't seen the spider-man no way home i haven't seen a bunch of other things as well too because of time i'll get to it when i get to it you know maybe 50 years later but i'll get to it <laughs>
I have such a collection of of books and comic books and so much content that I'm like, hey, at some point I'll get to retire, right? And at some point, I used to work with a guy, a sales guy, and he was a huge Star Wars fan. He bought all the Star Wars books as they were coming out, but he never got to read any of them. He was making a ton of money as a sales guy, and he was like, when I get into my mid fifties, I'm going to retire. I'm going to read all these books, right? And I haven't spoken to him for like a decade, but he was going into retirement. He was like, can I read all those Star Wars books, right? And it was before Disney bought LucasArts and all the extended universe kind of went away or became legends, or whatever it became. So it was before any of that happened because. I would have ripped him mercilessly, right? That's kind of how I am, right? I have this like stockpile of stuff that I'm like, at some point I'll retire and I'll get to consume all this stuff. Supporting the artist is sometimes more important, right? I buy a lot of stuff, never intending not to consume it, but I'm knowing it's going into a pile of other stuff, right? But a lot of times it's doing the right thing to support the creatives around you that you're enjoying their product. I'm envious of my nine and seven year old because they complain about all the free time they have. And I'm just kind of like, <sighs> I would love the free time they complain about having. When you start creating this particular series, what was the first image that popped into your mind that made you realize I could turn this into something bigger than not only this character I've created, but this world I'm trying to create. The introductory adventure that I created, when I settled, I went through like four or five iterations on the rules and I spent a bunch of time working on it. And as I started doing play testing, the opening scene, not the opening scene, the comic book doesn't open with this, but within the first like eight or 10 pages and kind of the opening scene of the game itself or the introductory adventure, the players and the characters in the book are confronted with a, a woman that's running through a forest and she has like a, a gag in her mouth and her hands are bound behind her back and somebody's chasing after her. The first arc of the comic book is called Chase and this adventure is called Chase. Seeing how three different groups reacted to that five minutes of build up and the characters introduce themselves and what do you know about each other and so on and then suddenly they're faced with this very kind of grim not you know an orc comes out of somewhere or something like they meet a traveler that gives them a riddle i mean this is like that kind of like hey there's a woman running through the forest and there's a man chasing after what are you going to do all three groups and again it's a game right but all three groups their gut reaction was like we have to help right there was never a question of like we're gonna you know hide and just see what happens like all three of them said well we're gonna have to see what goes on one of the images to me, I think I sent you the quick start comic, the review copy. There's an image on the back page. The artist was helping me kind of visualize this, drew an image of, of a man holding a shotgun with like holding the woman. And it was just this horrible image, right? Isn't it? You don't look at it and kind of say, oh, wow, this is a feel good story. You look at that, it's just grim, right? That is really what made me think about the dialogue between the players. I think that's what it was, right? Going through and listening to them talk and what they were saying to each other in character. I think that's what made me want to turn this into a comic book. You know, it's funny, the characters in the comic book are the pre-generated characters that you can play as part of Chase, right? So if you download that, you get the characters that are in the comic book. More and more, it just felt like one, right? As I started, like, because the same characters were being played by the same people. So I just wanted to take character creation off the table as I was playtesting. It was like, hey, here's your character. Here's their background. Here's the three words that describe them. Here's kind of like their attitudes and so on. Just seeing everyone adopt these characters and play it, it just felt like it was taking a form in my head. Probably six or eight months into writing the game, that's when I started working on the comic books. By the way, I have first three issues are being drawn at the moment, but I have scripts for like the next seven or eight issues that are written, right? Like I've thought like a ton about this. Lockdown was pretty brutal. And I used to travel a lot for my job and it's great. Lockdown took all that away, right? So suddenly I was at home seven days a week and I wasn't just in crappy hotel rooms in Grand Rapids and different places, right? I was actually getting to spend the time with my family. I really got a lot done during that time frame on the game rather and on the comic book, just bringing it all together. But again, I'm sorry for the long answer there, but that, that it was really the way that that the players reacted to that woman running through the forest. That's what made me want to turn it from a game to into a comic. Is there a comic that made you feel the way you hoped readers of your work will feel after reading it? That is a really good question. Yes, I think that there's a ton of comic books that have made me feel different ways. And I think that so much stuff doesn't impact me at all, right? Like I'll watch a movie, it doesn't affect me or I'll watch a TV show or whatever. Like I read a comic book and it's kind of fairly forgettable. So I think the things like I remember reading American Psycho in the 90s and that book is just very hard to get through. And I remember wanting to stop reading it. And I remember also thinking to myself, I've never read a book that made me queasy, right? I've never read a book that made me think, oh my God, I got to take a breath of fresh air before I keep going. So I wouldn't want to create that kind of impression on people, right? But I think that there are a ton of comic books, Gung Ho by A Blaze, who I think are a really strong up and coming publisher. That comic book is beautifully painted, right? And they do a great job of creating isolation for their central characters. It's post-apocalyptic, they're out in the middle of a jungle. Great story, like a little commune. It's really an amazingly done story. I, I can't get enough of it, but it's very slow to produce. I think it's just all painted. But that does a great job of instilling a kind of a wow about the world, right? And I think that, I hesitate to even say this, it was why I was vacillating a little bit. The crossed 
series, right? It was a series I didn't really enjoy, but I thought it did a really great job. Garth Ennis, comic book, he wrote the first book of it. I forget it was published by him. He told them you can have other people write stories in that world. Jamie Delano and a bunch of like other great horror writers went through in, I think, the 90 issue run of Crossed. I didn't really love the setting or the premise, right? I didn't really love the idea. It was kind of like a zombie apocalypse, but the zombies in this time just look the worst part of people with a cross appears on their head, right? And I, I didn't really love any of that. But man, that did a great job of painting out a very dystopian world. Some of it was written by David Lapham, who's one of my favorite writers. I didn't think it was his strongest work in Crossed. He also did an exceptional job in that series, like Garth Ennis did in the first run. And some of his work is just crap, right? I mean, some of his work in the 90s was really juvenile, but when he's good, I think he's one of the better writers in comics. I really do think he's phenomenal to kind of turn the genre on his head a little bit, right? His opening arcs and then some of the arcs in Badlands and Crossed, I think that would leave readers with the same sense of almost not necessarily hopelessness, right? It's just, hey, the whole world is really crappy. Whoever's in the story that's bringing good in that moment, that's the only spark of hope that you have in the world. You know what I mean? I think that does a really good job of captivating that. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? In my real world career, it's a great piece of advice. Someone told me this years ago, and I passed this on to a lot of people. Your first instinct is often right, but your first reaction is often wrong. It's one of those things that years ago was told to me, probably in my mid-20s, I'm guessing, right? And someone said that to me. It caused me to stop and reevaluate every one of my reactions after that. I mean, I would say it was the second best piece of advice because I've been getting like I've been given like really other good pieces of advice. But this is something that I think has really kind of shaped much of my behavior. I think as it comes to the production of particularly of the game, a couple of times I got very caught up in it, meaning the so into writing it that I almost, I have to boil it down and create like a, a quick start or an SRD or something to kind of boil it away because I'm so kind of caught up in all these different rule systems and blah, blah, blah. And I remember reading someone who posted on Reddit of all places, RPG de design, right? I think it was that forum and they posted and said, remember, this is meant to be a fun project. You're not going to make any money at this, right? So if you treat this like, hey, maybe I'm going to leave my day job and do this, you're an idiot, right? You should just really focus on creating a game that I want to play and anything that feels like it's overwhelming or I think that was really good advice I think there's other better advice but I think remembering very few people are going to make any money from this fear like either comic books or from RPGs do them because they're fun do it because you enjoy it I truly love my job but it doesn't fulfill any of the creative side of me it's a very technical role the only creativity is in problem solving or interacting with people but my god this gives me something that I've never gotten from a work environment so remembering the that's why I'm doing it because it gives me something that's a really good piece of advice what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? You know, um, I grew up in a, a really grotty place in England, right? So I grew up in this place called Gillingham. Whenever I meet anyone from England, I tell them where I'm from. They always have that, oh. They always react to it in a very specific way, right? We had a dockyard that had been in place for like 300 years and it got closed down. If you ever saw Shogun, the boat Will Blackthorn left from was came out of the Chatham dockyard where I was from, right? So it'd been around for like hundreds of years and it got closed down. And we had like 70% unemployment in the town. I grew up, my mom drilled into me the importance of reading, right? Because I think she felt super helpless and hopeless in this town because it was just a horrible, horrible horrible, horrible place, right? And it felt like the only people that ever left were the people that went to college, right? And then they never came back again, right? And so very early on, in a really good way, you know that thing that kids hate when you say to them, go and look it up in a dictionary, how do you spell that word? My mum used to make me look things up in a dictionary and then explain the explanation, right? And understand it. I want to say probably six or seven or eight, right? I learned very early on in my life in that way, having a strong vocabulary and understanding how words went together, it elevated how how you thought about things. She, she died like however long ago, like 30 years ago or so. But like, I mean, I love my mother, like her memory endlessly. She was chronically uneducated, which she wanted to make sure that that wouldn't happen to me. So I was the first person from like either side of the family that went on to any kind of like college level education. And it was because my mom had taught me earlier on that like, hey, if you learn the right words for things, you can express yourself in the right way and it will elevate how you think. I think I was really lucky in that I had someone chronically undereducated, very smart lady, right? Who could have probably done something with her life, but she came from that post-war era where women weren't educated, right? And she was kind of like raised to be like basically a housewife. I think she was dead set on that. And so that's when I realized there are all these different periods in my life when like words have been super important. Like, 
like coming up with the right word. And I think that all throughout my life, I've realized the words really have power. If you can express yourself in the right way, you can win a ton of people over. And I think so much of communication and how you frame things, most people miss the point, I think, of what they're trying to get to. So you asked me what the second best piece of advice was. The best piece of advice I've ever been given in a work setting was always ask yourself and always ask the people around you, to what outcome? So if you're trying to do something, why are you trying to do it? To what outcome? Like, why are you doing it? And it's the best piece of advice I've ever been given in my life. So much of the time when I hear people talk, I'm thinking to myself, what outcome are you going for there? Because it seems to me like you're trying to be misunderstood, or it seems to me like you're trying to be antagonistic without meaning to be antagonistic or rude. And so, so often I see and I hear people interact and I feel like they don't understand the value of communication and words because they go at it from the wrong perspective. And they so rarely get the outcome they're going for. But as someone that considers themselves a writer, and I, I've written five novels, I've just never got anything published, right? I've been writing my literally my whole life. There's somebody much smarter than me that said, seek first to understand and then be understood. And I don't think anyone gets that as they go through life or a very small proportion of the population gets it. So many people are stuck on transmit that they're not actively listening to what the other people are saying to them. So they're just making the wrong point or they're going at this from the wrong direction and they ultimately get to the wrong outcome. Sorry for the long-winded answer, but I think words are the most powerful tool, one of the most powerful tools that we as humans have at our disposal. For me, it's always been a, a majorly important part of my life. TTRPGs are something I've loved seeing like YouTube streams on and Twitch and all that other stuff. And I think they're completely fascinating. And I've had other people in the TTRPG circles uh, be on the show as well too. So I find it incredible. And it's more of a and d style is what I, I happen to watch. So looking at your game, cool. I think it's pretty amazing to just kind of give it a different twist. There's different styles of games like you previously mentioned, but what makes your game different compared to say the traditional TTRPGs that we're all familiar with? Thank you. I think this is at the core of it, right? I think this is a very saturated market. One thing I think is true about this hobby is it tends to draw in creative and smart people. And so there's a lot of output that comes from those people. There's a lot of competition in this space because a lot of these smart people are like, hey, I'm gonna write my own game and I can put it on you know, drive through RPG or whatever, and I can get it out there. So I think there's a lot of competition. I think the USP of Distemper, like the separation or kind of what makes it different, it's a very grounded and realistic experience. A lot of people play role-playing games, TTRPGs to get away from the real world, right? And they wanna play something completely fantastic and they wanna to play Dungeons and Dragons or what a Pathfinder, whatever it is, right? And they want to kind of go into, you know, I used to play the Star Wars role playing game a lot. I totally get it, right? You want to go and play in a world, in a setting, and tell those stories. Distemper is really intended for people that want to play as an ordinary person in a very dangerous world. I often describe it as role playing in the real world, right? There's no fantastic setting. Your game is taking place in a localized setting, right? I have. So when I first started playtesting it, I bought this map for people, right? And I have one of the United States and I have one for where the first campaign is set in Delaware. And the idea was that this was a real world, right? So you'd get a map and you'd have to figure out where you were going to get to and we'd figure out travel times and so on. Part of the appeal of this, and I think some people will love this, and I think it will leave a lot of people cold, is that you're not playing as an action hero, right? You're not a superhero. You're playing as a teacher. You're playing as whoever may have survived this extinction level event. You're playing as a, an ordinary person in, in an extraordinary world. I think for people that want a real escape, this one appeal for them. I think for people that like the idea of having to figure out how to get ongoing supplies, right? And having to figure out how they can re recruit people to their cause and potentially build a community. They can recruit and train apprentices, right? So I think that this game will appeal to people that aren't necessarily looking for that kind of truly fantastic escape, but people that are looking for a more grounded experience, they've kind of got to get through. And I referenced earlier The Road by Comic McCarthy. So that world of like having to survive against it. And then there was a Netflix series called Black Summer that ran for two seasons, right? And the second season was like zombies had pretty much died out, most of them. So it was very much human against human. So people that look at that and they're kind of like, hey, how would I fare in the real world, right? How would I survive? Like, what would I do to secure a supply of food? How would I deal with people that are going to bully me and try and come up and take whatever? I Like, that's who I think this will appeal to. This will probably interest some people. What I've done is I've created, this is the Zurich Sum Games website, right? I'm moving it over to the Distemperverse website i'll happily give you access to this but this is part of what the appeal is for some of my players right and i have a very strong core like i mentioned i've been very lucky because i have a very strong core of regular play testers that have adopted this one of them has coded 
the shit out of Roll20. It's an amazing thing, right? But this is where our current uh, campaign is set, right? And if, if there's anyone watching from Astoria, Oregon, I'd love to hear from them because I'm just making this shit up out of whole cloth and I'd love to get a sense of what the town is like. But this is where my players are based, right? So we get to, to add these different markers, right? And we get to kind of make reminders of what's going on. So as these guys are figuring out how they survive, we can keep reminders of like, okay, so there's a guy called T. He, he found some books while he was scavenging. He's allowed him to catalog the library. It means he's now going to get you know modifiers on research checks somebody else figured out they found a, a book on converting a car over to ethanol so he's undertaking that as a research task so this this is um how we play the game right and this is our second setting because we we this, we're on a another play campaign where we're using this and previous you know previous setting had been over in delaware this is really appealing to the players they can keep this track of the living world right they can plot out where they're going to get to i have kind of gm notes about all the stuff that takes place around here so it really doesn't matter what they want to go and do I have this all set up. So it really goes back to what separates this or why do I think this is different? The way we're playing it is role-playing in the real world is often how I describe it because you're playing a real person in a real place and these people have to figure out how to survive. So currently this play test, which is only a few sessions in, there's a power struggle. There's maybe 600 people left in Astoria hmm. and there's a couple of different factions that are forming. This is to test our rules. So it's not my most creative thinking, but on one side, you have an ex-sheriff. His tendency is a little bit to be a bit more authoritarian. And on the other side, you have an ex-Nike um, executive that's trying to restore kind of more of a, a democracy. The players currently are trying to figure out, well, who are they going to align with or do they want to run their own campaign? They're essentially canvassing to try and figure out how to draw this team together because what they've started to figure out is over, you know, somewhere over here, there's some kind of weird religious cult, right? And over time, they're going to have to face down that weird religious cult. But as they go through it, they will be exploring all of this area. So last session ended with a plane flying overhead as they were all talking and they were kind of like with you know why is there a plane and one of them realized by looking at the map hey there's there's a regional airport over here maybe it came from there this game really won't appeal to people that i don't think that are going to want to play in a fantasy world right i don't think this is going to appeal to those but i do think there's going to be a group of people that are going to really enjoy role playing in the real world survival is, is definitely interesting and, it, and while you were talking about that while you were describing it it reminded me of like video games that have survival aspects to it like frostpunk yeah. and shadow run and, yeah. and a bunch of others as well too while in the true dystopian style it, it had definitely had hints of that but it would be an, an interesting mental exercise as well too to see how i would react or how other people would react for it and you mentioned the play testers and i think that's the key aspect of of making a good game a good game is you need people that are not so focused in on the world to break out of the mold that you maybe have kind of set yourself in when you were creating this. So who are some of the earlier play testers and what were some of the advice they gave you when they were playing it? I'll jump to a later play tester if that's okay. So one sure. of my early play testers, I used to run, uh, again, I'm obviously English, right? So I grew up reading 2000 AD and Judge mm -hmm. Dredd. So yes. I, I was running a Judge Dredd campaign and I, I put out adverts on like, you know, Reddit and on Roll20. I just ran into this guy, an English guy living in New Zealand. So going back to one of my early play testers, he is such an ardent supporter of this, right? I mean, he's as close to a co-creator as I've got. He coded out Roll20. He's been like a constant and companion throughout this however i've known the other guy matt for like four years or so and he's just been a rock throughout all of this but there's a newer player a guy called john and he it's been great he's run the game twice for people that i don't know and then recorded it and sent me the session if you go to roll 20 there's a and search for zero sum games with an x there's a thing called empty so i created a play test guide which gives you there's a comic a six page comic up front which gives you kind of one possible outcome for the scenario or the setting and then it's really just a single scene encounter a group of players roll up to get something out of what they think is an abandoned gas station and it's not quite as abandoned as they think so it's really just a play test it's designed to take like an hour to an hour and a half a gm like it walks they don't have to know anything about the game they can open this it will walk them through everything they need to know as they're playing this for other players or as they're running the session and it has pre-generated characters and everything this guy john took that guide and ran it twice for two different groups of people honest to god like they were both three hours long and at the end of both of those sessions my i swear to god my cheeks hurt because i'd sat there without meaning to just smiling for three hours listening to how two different groups approach the game their understanding of the rules seeing 
that kind of cold play test where this guy had been a player, so he understood the rules, but he'd never GM'd the game. And frankly, he'd only ever GM two games of Dungeons and Dragons before that. So this was a whole new experience for him. And part of the reason I think he wanted to do it was because I'd laid out the steps to be in a GM. Watching the cold play test, watching a new GM, where he struggled, where things didn't make sense or he couldn't explain it clearly, and then how the players reacted to it. And again, I've got no idea who any of these people are. That was gold as a game designer. I would pay for that experience seeing this kind of like third party removed almost like i'm at a two-way mirror just like window looking as i kind of look through and they're playing my game kurt i can't tell you how valuable that was and a bunch of edits and iterations and changes came out of that because i suddenly saw things from a very detached perspective where i was looking at it through their eyes because i heard what they were complaining about in one instance i was listening to the group of players and i was like oh my god like they're absolutely right and i changed like a pretty substantial game mechanic just because i hadn't seen the massive floor like this hole in the ground that i was building that i was so busy skirting around that suddenly i was like yeah i've got to put wood over that before someone falls on the spikes below but one last thing what i would say is what i found out recently and i haven't used any of them yet there are a couple of discord groups like i think there's one called the playtester hub there's another one that's called a uh, blind tape playtesters.org and then the playtest hub these people will apparently playtest your game for you and i've looked through their chat right i mean they're doing it they'll take your game and they'll read it and they'll play it cold for you because it's their way of experiencing a bunch of new games so i think the experience i got is like gold and i think every designer should hope to be able to get that there are groups that would, uh, would facilitate that for people that kind of like detached perspective you could probably get one of these groups to do that for you one more tip on that front for people i've been very lucky because i found a bunch of people through reddit and i think the trick there is putting it up as like a short form thing right so i've gone to reddit and said hey i need play testers for two sessions or whatever it was like often i've done it for one session just to test out certain rules but i found that there's enough people on reddit that if you can post in the right way, that's where I found all of my playtesters from, right? Almost all of my playtesters, actually. It really is about creating the right post. And I'm, I'm not actually very good at this like self-marketing stuff, right? And so I think that where I've succeeded is by saying, here's a link to the quick start so people can see if they're interested in the rules. Here's when we'll be doing it. Here's exactly what's needed of you. Here's what we're going to be covering. And it'll be in this amount of session. People have looked at that and said, yeah, I'll play this and I'll do it for like one or two sessions or whatever. But I think that the trick for me was presenting the world in an interesting enough way where I wasn't trying to sell people on a game. I was trying to sell them on solving a problem, right? Help me in the play, like the post-apocalyptic world, come in and do a combat play test for me and help me balance the weapons. That was one that, that was very well received. There are sources out there in addition to these discords I mentioned, but I've been really lucky, I think, with Reddit because I hear nothing but bad things from other people about Reddit and their experiences, but I've been, I've been super lucky. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Frank Miller for comic books, but really for storytelling. I was losing all interest in comic books when I was probably 14 or 15 because it just felt like superheroes, right? It just felt like it was the same shit I've been reading for like 10 years. And then I stumbled across Born Again, right? Which was Frank Miller, like Daredevil 227 to 233 or 2334. And it just changed the way I always looked at comic books, right? I realized that they weren't for kids, right? Like the storytelling in that was super dark and it was just like heroin addict girlfriend sells his identity to the kingpin that destroys his life and gets him disbarred and sued. And it was just the most amazing story that I read it. It was like a gut punch at the beginning of the first issue. So that really shaped it. And I think that Frank Miller is a very divisive character. And I've read a lot of stuff by him I don't agree with. And I don't think we align like socially or politically. I think there's a lot of stuff that I would probably not like Frank Miller on. But I think if you go back to the 80s and look at the seminal work he did on Dark Knight Returns and things like Sin City and just some of the other work, Daredevil for sure, but the work he's done over the years, I think Frank Miller has been a huge impact on the stories I've wanted to tell. The dark nature of being able to tell those stories mental health and the issues and the things that really impact people rather than just the superficial events that they're reacting to from a professional standpoint you've created obviously a comic book series as well as a ttrpg game and you're creating many more amazing things in the future that we don't have time unfortunately to talk about but i'm happy to have you back on to touch on those in the future for sure so professionally you're successful in that regard do you consider yourself personally successful very 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 so it depends what you mean right so i have the most wonderful family like that's me so my parents are both dead right i don't really have like i have a sibling that i'm not very close to she's still back in the uk love her a lot but just not very close right and so i went through most of my life thinking i wouldn't have kids and that i'd just have a series of sort of relationships and then i met my wife when i was 40 and she 
was a little bit younger than me, but I, I met her when I was 40 and I'd pretty much given up. I'd resigned myself to being this old man. So I feel personally super successful because I have a wife and kids that support me and that I love. And kind of funny story, my seven-year-old son admitted to my wife the other day that he knew some bad words and she asked him which one. He said the F word, F-U-C-K. And she said, where did you learn that? And he said, I swear to God, this is true. He said, I read daddy's comic book. And I was like, hey, I just won that by distorting my child's mind, right? I feel very successful on that point. And then personally, in terms of the game and what I've created, I feel unconscionably successful, right? I had a comic book publisher that offered, I didn't even have to approach them. A comic book publisher offered to publish my comic book once they saw it. So I feel very lucky there. And then I've created a game world that has been compelling enough, probably eight or 10 people that they've taken it on and created their own stories inside of this world, which goes back to that map that, you know, another step forward for the game at some point is to create this web interface where other players can do what you saw that I had done, right? I mean, that would be the end goal of this to create a package with something called the tapestry and actually have someone working on this for me now figuring out kind of the coding part of it how to create a world that other people can add to ultimately what i would like to create is like a homebrew repository for distemper where people are creating their own adventures and then updating that map so as someone new coming into it could look at that map and see all these stories that have taken place all around the remainder of the u.s or the world or wherever they're put in so i feel very lucky personally because i have the greatest family i have which i never thought i have like i really have a great family and then I'm getting to do something that seems to be impacting people. The comic book, again, someone seems to like that enough to want to publish it. And then the game is popular enough with the people that have been exposed to it. Other people are running games for other people and building their own campaigns around it. So, Kurt, thank you for that question. There are days I wake up and feel almost abnormally lucky or absurdly lucky. I just never thought I'd be this happy at 53. It's great. Thank you. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? All right, the risk is sounding very cheesy. I mentioned before I work in IT, right? So I have like 120 people working working for me, but at different points in my career, I've had like three, 400 engineers that are working for me in different departments. I've had to craft a lot of messages over the years for people. I do a lot of all hands. I get up in front of like a thousand people on a semi-regular basis, like presenting to them at our yearly conference. So I have to craft a lot of messages. Again, it sounds so pretentious to say this. Nelson Mandela once said this thing about, I never fail. I either win or I learn. That's been my approach for years. The second pretentious thing is I've written on my whiteboard, both at home and at work. It's super pretentious to say this. And it's an Anne Rand quote that I read when I was in my early 20s. And the quote is, the question is not who will let me, but who can stop me? Those have been my driving philosophies for years, right? So how do I deal with failure? I don't fail. I either win or I learn and I get better and I come back and I win the second time. It's also about putting this all in context, right? Back to what I said earlier, I'm very good at asking myself, what's the outcome that I'm going for? Honestly, to God, hand to my heart, I will take a public loss and a failure if it gets me to the outcome that I'm looking for. If someone needs to beat me in an arm wrestling contest to look good to their family, hey, guess what? They can beat me in an arm wrestling contest all day at work. So I feel that failure is a very subjective thing, right? Try and learn from my failures because I've seen them eat people up over the years. You know, those people that peaked in high school, right? And they should have been more successful, but they were just held back by their failures. Screw it. Like failure to me is an opportunity to get better and learn, right? So I'll internalize all that and take it back to what was the outcome I was going for and where did I go wrong and what would I do if I could get in a time machine and go back and do that all again so I struggle like any human with failure but I try and learn from it because I don't want it to, to eat me up like I was going to do to other people the other generation is looking at your work and becoming inspired to be creative in their own way whether it's as a common creator creator maybe possibly a TTRPG creator in the future or something that they're creative in in the future who knows what that may be and the fact that you have the younger generation currently with you looking at yourself as a creator person maybe you're inspiring them in some way shape or form especially with your son winning the swear word contest how can they inspire the generation that follows them by doing what they love. I think that people are inspired by passion. One of the truisms that I've lived my life by is that people will support what they help create. So if you can get people engaged with an idea and pass the passion on, that becomes their own passion. I've done this for years when building teams, right? Like get people behind an idea and get them to support it and get them to help you build it out. And suddenly they feel responsible for it, right? What we've all got to pass along, if we're ever going to inspire someone, it's a combination of two things. It's the body of work that's output and then it's the obvious passion and work that went into creating it. And I think that's what's inspiring for people. I think that people look at a story or a story makes them feel a certain way and they want to do that. I've known a couple of movie directors or a couple of directors, I should say, in my life, and none of them have ever done it in isolation, right? None of them ever came from like a tribe in Borneo and they turned up suddenly in London and they were kind of like, oh, I want to become a movie. They've always had this passion. They've seen other people's movies and the worlds that have been created for them since they were a kid. And I think that it's the good ones of those movies or games 
games or comics or TV shows or music or whatever it is. I think people are inspired by that passion. I was a musician when I was growing up, like a lot of people, right? I was a musician all the way through my teens to my early twenties. I still play now, right? But I was like trying to be a professional musician for a while. And a lot of that came from, you know, it, it wasn't from listening to bland pop. It was listening to The Doors and The Rolling Stones and all these different people, Pink Floyd, people that had a true passion and creative yearning to get their shit out. They were the people that inspired me to become a musician, right? Frank Miller, I mentioned earlier, Alan Moore is another great comic book writer. There's all these comic book writers that have just been very different in what they do. And that's what's inspired me. You know, since my very first ever role-playing session, which was just me and another kid that I was at school with when I was like 11 or 12, just the fact that it's the creating stories for, you know, one or more people. I think that if you can give that experience, if you can pass on your passion for something, frankly, if you can create output that people really like, obviously a necessity, I think that's it, right? I think that's what inspires because people look at this and they say, hey, I think I could do this, right? Or I've got a story I want to tell, or this was great. It made me feel this way. I'm going to do something else that's going to make somebody else feel different, but equivalent. If your life was a comic book or a video game or a TTRPG for that matter, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? That's a really great question. The title of it would be The Born Again Hooligan. I'm trying to think what the soundtrack would be. The soundtrack would really be a mishmash of stuff. A lot of people that have been kind of the soundtrack of my life at different points, and I'll put it on, it will very like people like PJ Harvey or the aforementioned Pink Floyd, right? There's a bunch of bands that I've listened to different times in my life that have created that soundtrack, right? And so I think that I could probably call out the types of artists like Radiohead and Bob Dylan was a huge influence of mine growing up. So I think individual songs from these artists that would go to make up um, a bad influence on my kids because they're both big fans of the Rage Against the Machine song Killing in the Name of, right? And I was at a festival in England in 1993 Glastonbury, like a huge festival where they played and someone videoed that clip. So I've shown that clip to my kids and said to them, hey, I was in that audience somewhere. I've got no idea but I was in that audience. So I think songs like that very clearly paint a point I can listen to that song and it will instantly take me back. So I think my soundtrack is a little bit more idiosyncratic. But the Born Again Hooligan I think that would be the title for the comic book that would sum up my life. Now you just have to write it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm living it every day. It shouldn't be too difficult. <laughs> there you go. Well, Tony, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been great, Kurt. Thank you so much. And thank you to your audience and everyone that, that stuck with us. But I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about something that I'm so passionate about. And again, a little bit starstruck because I've been watching this for a while. So it's just nice to be on this side of the camera talking to you about this rather than on that side of the screen, just listening to you talk to other people so thank you again well i, I appreciate that i i never know who i get to reach and i i'm glad i get to connect to amazing talented people like yourself and well, i can't you. wait to see what you do in the future and you're definitely more than welcome to come back on as well too thank you before i let you go though where can we find you how can we support you and of course where can we find your amazing comic and ttrpg game distemp thank you thank you so the easiest place is to go to distemperverse.com and i think you have that up on the screen now mm -hmm. you can sign up there there's like a, a light box that comes up if you've been on the screen for 30 seconds given your email i have a very strict irregular but important update policy right so i think i've sent like a total of three emails to the mailing list ever but it's always about hey there's a major release coming up you can get this document from here so i'd say that's probably the best way i'm also on twitter a lot i'm not the biggest marketer on Twitter because I find that turns people off, right? I know that I end up muting some people that I otherwise enjoy their content because all I see from them is adverse adverts. That's a good place to follow me if you're interested in getting into a discussion with me. And I talk a lot on different threads about different things, but I'm not really promoting myself. So I would really say follow me on Twitter if you want to know more about me and kind of see like various stages of development. If you're more interested in finding about the game and the release, Distemperverse. And then to your point, the comic is getting released. I think it's in August. It'll be in all comic books, um, all comic book stores if they order from this publisher and you can get it from the blood moon comics website as well when it's released so i think that's all the different ways of getting hold of me well like i said that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking you can of course find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking.com that's the word two not the number two of course our youtube channel is a lot more updated than our website because i am only one person that is youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgt media and the podcast is back after 12 or so years but you can find that at two geeks talking podbean.com is the main site but it is available on all other audio streaming services so pick your favorite search for two geeks talking do me a favor like subscribe download this episode and share it with your friends because this has a lot of value and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking